Hello everyone. Welcome to the final lecture of CS220 course, Fall 2020 semester. We saved a fun topic for the last lecture. We are going to have a discussion about randomness. Before we get started with today's lecture topic, I want to go through a set of announcements. P13 is due on Wednesday, December 9th. This is a hard deadline, meaning that no late days are allowed for P13. We will also not be allowing any resubmissions for P13, excepting for extreme cases like students receiving a zero test score for the autograder script. A lot of students have reached out to me with their interest for applying for peer mentor position for CS220 course. I'll be sending out an email sometime this week, which will include a Google form application for future CS220 peer mentor positions. All of you know what it takes to become a peer mentor for CS220. You will have to hold peer mentor hours to guide students with their project related issues and also material related issues. Please do apply for this position if you're interested in becoming a peer mentor for CS220. I might hire for a few positions in spring 2021, but it is more likely that I'll be considering all of you as the pool of interview candidates for fall 2021 positions. Do apply to the position even if you want to interview during the fall semester instead of the spring semester. I'll make sure to include uh, one question about future entries as part of the Google Form application. I hope all of you enjoyed learning programming with us throughout the course of this semester. If you really liked CS220, the direct follow-up course would be CS320, which is taught by Tyler. Please do check out CS320. Know that CS3, sorry, CS320 is required for the data science major. So that would be the follow-up course for you to watch out for just in case if you're interested in declaring a data science major. If you're interested in learning further programming, then you can consider the 200, 300, 400 series offered by the computer science department, which teaches programming using Java programming language. Over the course of this semester, I've mentioned other courses like Introduction to Databases, which is 564, uh, Introduction to Computer Networks, which is 640. You can possibly also consider Introduction to Operating Systems, which is 537. Some of the Computer Science series courses, 200, 300, 400, uh, form prerequisite for the other advanced courses, which I just mentioned. If you're interested in those topics of courses, then I would strongly recommend you to go through the 200, 300, 400 series of courses. Let me talk about office hours. This week, Wednesday, will be the last day of office hours for TAs and peer mentors. That's because they are also students and they have uh, their own final exams to deal with. Instructors will be increasing their office hours uh, starting uh, probably this week, Thursday. For now, I'm not able to give enough information about that because I've been dealing with a possible COVID exposure for my family. Uh, we are all doing fine, but uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out uh, uh, whether the uh, to send my son to daycare or not and uh, uh, whether uh, we need to get tested or not. So uh, that's one of the main reasons you might see a uh, few cases where like uh, I have typed in information coming soon as part of today's lecture slide deck rather than uh, actually typing out information for that. The delay of recording today's lecture was also due to the fact that I'm dealing with um, my family's possible COVID exposure. My apologies for that. I meant to record this lecture on Saturday itself. Let's talk about final exam. Final exam will be held during a 30-hour window period uh, starting at 6 p.m. on December 14th and ending at 11.59 uh, p.m. on December 15th. 
all of the timings would be Madison timing. Please make sure that you are able to take the final exam, which would be a two hour exam within that 30 hour window period. If you are not able to do so, please fill out the final exam conflict form today. I'll be dealing with all of the conflict requests by today and you have only until today to report conflict to me. I've already sent out the, a preparation guideline email for the final exam. If you haven't already read that, please go and read that. The general recommendation is that you should go through uh, all the readings, slides and specifically lecture demo code for all the topics from the beginning of the semester. Focus on the topics which you lack confidence on and make sure that you go through the lecture demo code in detail for those lecture topics. By go through lecture demo code, I mean sit and read the code, not run the code. First read the code, make sure you are able to understand that and predict an output and then run the code to verify that you are getting the same output as your predicted output. It is definitely worthwhile going through what questions you got wrong for midterms. We are going to have uh, midterm 1 and midterm 2 review sessions for, sorry, sections as part of the final exam. Let me clarify that so that it's clear. If the final exam contains specific sections which will be reviews for midterm 1 and midterm 2. So it is definitely worthwhile for you to go back and understand what you got wrong for the questions included as part of midterm 1 and midterm 2, which is exam 1 and exam 2. Do review the code that you wrote for all of the projects that will uh, help you prepare for the final exam. Final exam is all about reading code. So the more code you read, the more practice you get. I would strongly recommend you to prepare a note sheet despite the exam being open book, open material, open interpreter. We have a lot of material that is covered from the beginning of the semester until this last lecture. It can get really overwhelming if you don't have a note sheet for the exam. So I'm going to strongly recommend you to prepare a note sheet for the purpose of exam. I'll be doing a live review session on Wednesday. The live review session will happen via the optional Q&A BBC session link. Feel free to attend either of the live review sessions. Even if you're not enrolled in section one, you can attend the section one's live review session. I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you in the live review session. That will give us the last opportunity to meet for this semester. Let's talk about course evaluations. I've already sent out a couple of uh, emails about course evals. We value student feedback really. I'm sure all of you who filled out the, the feedback form on the course website non-anonymously know about that because all of you would have received a personal email from me either giving you further directions to help with your feedback request or uh, thanking you for the feedback requests uh, so that we are able to improve this particular course. Feedback helps us evolve this course for future generation of students. It also helps me evolve as an instructor. So please take a few minutes uh, to fill out the final course evaluations. It will definitely bring a smile on my face to see any kind of uh, uh, nice words or constructive criticism as part of the feedback. So please help me improve as an instructor and also help the course improve for future students. For your ease, I've given the AFIS link for section one, section two of CS220 and also section one and section two of CS319. Mike said he'll update the links for uh, his sections of uh, 220 and 319 sometime today. So please watch out for an updated slide deck just in case if you're enrolled in section three. Right now, the evals uh, feedback is around 40% uh, uh, for section one. So section one is winning for now. Uh, so section two and section three, please catch up and make sure that uh, uh, you, you guys also fill out the evals for us. 
Thank you so much uh, for considering this request and spending a few minutes to fill out the evals. Let's get uh, today's lecture started. We are going to start today's lecture by going through a fun experiment. So I have uh, two sets of coin tosses here. There are 16 coin tosses from each of those sets. One of those uh, was randomly generated using Python script and the other one was picked by me. Go ahead and pause the lecture video here uh, for a couple of seconds and see if you're able to identify which one is the truly random one and which one was just picked by me. So if you were thinking uh, the second one was picked by me, then you had the correct answer. So you might be wondering why is that the case? Both of these look quite random, correct? So if you count the number of heads and tails in the second one, you'll notice that there are exactly eight tails and eight heads. Is it 50-50% uh, random? Not really, right? The chances of uh, you getting exactly eight heads and exactly eight tails is uh, probably quite low. One uh, thing to notice about the first set over here, which was randomly generated, is that uh, uh, we got seven heads in a row, which is kind of scary, but it actually happened. Before uh, I proceed further with the topic of randomization, I want to make a few recommendations for you to go through with respect to a winter reading. Students who spend the time outside the coursework on related topics uh, to the coursework are the ones who typically uh, excel in terms of gaining knowledge beyond the coursework. So I would strongly recommend you to consider some of these books for winter reading. You'll have uh, a few weeks of time and uh, unfortunately for everyone, all of us are stuck at home this winter. So uh, that would be a nice time to do some reading and catch up on extra material outside of coursework. The first book that I want to talk about is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kamen. Hopefully I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Sorry if I'm not. Uh, this is a really good book because it's an, at an intersection between the psychology and statistic fields. It sort of gives you a sense of this uh, stati statistical intuitive guess about things. Uh, really uh, nice book. I've only browsed part of it. I'm planning to read the rest of it, which I haven't uh, already done. So just so you know, these uh, book readings are partly generated by Tyler and partly generated by me. So there might be books which I haven't completely finished reading either. So I'm going to make a recommendation for you. And I'm also going to make sure that I read uh, uh, the parts of the book which I haven't completed yet. That said, uh, if you have any winter reading recommendations for me, please send an email. I'd be very happy to consider your suggestions and go through the suggested books myself. So as I mentioned, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow is at an intersection between psychology and uh, statistic fields. It will give you a really good sense of uh, whether uh, uh, your intuitive guess about some something statistical is correct or not. The next book recommendation is The Signal and Noise by Nate Silver. If you don't know who Nate Silver is, uh, Nate Silver is the person who found uh, 538. I'm sure most of you are aware of what 538 is by now, considering that uh, we just went through a United States presidential election. 538 is really famous uh, because it applies statistics for journalism uh, in order to make predictions about election results. The name 538 comes from the fact that there are 538 electors in the US presidential election. Before Nate Silver, the uh, found 538. Uh, he was a big guy in the field of statistics. Uh, he also did things like uh, uh, use statistics to earn a bunch of money in the online poker game. He has also uh, wrote, a, sorry, written a software for uh, predicting uh, which baseball players 
contribute really well to their team despite uh, having low ratings do check out his book uh, really nice book the signal and the noise the next book which i want to recommend is the visual display of quantitative information by edward tufty this is a really good book if you want to refine your plotting skills really well plotting is uh, the most powerful tool that you can learn as a data scientist i've already tried to give you a sense of intuition about pl- how difficult it is to make decisions with respect to choosing one type of plotting for a given data set analysis this book uh, will help you refine your thought process further on the topic of plotting the final statistic book which i want to recommend is statistics done wrong by alex reinhardt it's a little bit heavy but uh, something for you to check out uh, in case you're interested in furthering your statistic knowledge with respect to learning more python i want to make two specific uh, recommendations the first one would be fluent python by luciano ramalo this is a really good book uh, for you to read in order to gain more python expertise i've also listed uh, the think python book which is the reading for cs220 course you can go through the object oriented uh, concepts as part of the think python book by reading the o o chapter in the think python book right uh, let's actually dive into the real content of today's lecture which is about randomization so you might be wondering why exactly randomization is uh, useful let's imagine that you're playing a game you would want to make the game behave in a different way every time you play the game correct if it is doing the exact same thing every time you play the game then it's a pretty boring game and you would not want to play with it for a long time that's one application of randomization in computer science the second is that i'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, what are passwords there are a lot uh, more uh, uh, ways to maintain <coughs> secrets in computer science uh you'll be dealing with randomization whenever you have uh, some sort of a secret human beings are not good at uh, generating secrets we know that uh, we struggle with uh, generating uh, passwords in general so we are going to trust the uh, computer's randomization in order to be able to generate secret keys for helping with various computer security aspects the final uh, need that i'm going to talk about with respect to the topic of randomization is uh, being able to simulate things we have already covered an example of this uh, while analyzing the sp500 stock uh, price index data set uh, we ran uh, hundreds of simulations to be able to determine uh, what would be the risk of investing 1000 dollars in the sp500 index we are going to focus uh, on simulation for the purpose of our discussion on the topic of randomization here the first uh, function that i'm going to talk about is the choice function we have already gone through the choice function and the choices function in the random module those are kind of uh, limited what we are going to do today is we are going to discuss about the choice function in the numpy module you have already installed the pandas module numpy comes uh, installed with the pandas module because it's a requirement so all of you should have numpy installed on your uh, uh, laptop already so what we are going to do today is we are going to learn about the numpy modules random module so it's going to be numpy dot random module and we are going to learn about the choice function in numpy random module you will find a lot of useful functions in numpy random module so you can go check out uh, the documentation for the numpy random module for the purpose of uh, final exam you only need to know about the choice function in the numpy random module let's talk about uh, how choice uh, in numpy random module is different from choice in the regular random module so just like the regular random module choice you're going to be able to choose from a list of items so let me give you an example here i'm sure all of you love the rock paper scissors game 
So we are going to be using the rock, rock paper scissors example uh, a lot for today's lecture. So I am going to have a list which contains rock, paper and scissors and let's say that I want to randomly choose one value then I will be calling the choice function in numpy.random module. So I am importing from numpy.random choice. What I am going to get in result is I am going to get one of those values in the list of items that we pass as an argument to the choice function. The number of times I execute this particular uh, snippet of code, the number of times I get different kinds of outputs, correct? So for the first execution, I get scissors. Let's say that uh, I execute it again and I get a rock next time or I might get a scissors or I might even uh, get paper. How can we get multiple choices out of the list of items that we are passing to the choice function? We can do that by passing a size argument. So the parameter size takes two different values. One type of value is one integer value. If you pass a single integer value, then you're going to get uh, that many number of uh, choices out of your uh, choice selection here. Recall that uh, we do what is called as sampling with replacement here. That's why even if your choice of items has three items, you're able to choose five items out of those three items because you'll replace an item back into the list of items after you've, you've made a choice. So the choice function returns what is called as NumPy array. You don't need to know anything about NumPy array other than the fact that it works like a list. So you'll be able to do indexing into the NumPy array. You can very easily convert uh, the output of choice function into a series by saying series of and that will just make those uh, different selections which would be the five selections into a series of values over here. I mentioned you can pass two different types of arguments for size. The second type of argument is a tuple of two values. The tuple of two values represents a matrix size. The first value represents the number of rows, so that represents the top-down dimension of the matrix. The second uh, value in your tuple represents the number of columns, so that represents the left-right dimension of your matrix. So when you have a matrix of values generated by the choice function, a natural thing would be for you to convert that into a data frame, so that's what we are doing in this particular example. So I'll wrap up this video here. In the next video, we'll go through a demo with rock, paper, scissor example over here.